Um, right, so this is my talk on post phenomenology uh, and time. Seemingly um, out there concept, but let me explain a bit more about what it actually is. So, in my opinion, the world as we know it uh, has changed since the work of the two classical phenomenologists, Heidegger and Marlo Ponti. Technology has progressed to such an extent that uh, it has, in my opinion, affected the way that we conceptualize the very essence of time um, and space. The subjective sort of perspective or sort of phenomenal alterity through technology is one that has only recently been approached by sort of Alison Wiley's work um, with the virtual versions of the self. So within this talk, I hope to demonstrate that phenomenology within archaeology has been the source or sourced from an outdated sort of form of phenomenology uh, and is and has been unfit to be used the tool within the technologically advanced world. Um, I shall demonstrate, hopefully, that post-phenomenology is, at the very least, a more up-to-date, pragmatic, methodological tool which we can be used to help remove sort of modern biases situated with our te technologically altered worldview. So, I move it. So, really, the outline of this talk is I'm going to sort of have a brief history of phenomenology within archaeology, uh, specifically post-phenomenology as a sort of methodology, and then sort of my own applications of this uh, to my own research um, in Bulgaria. So from the late 1980s to the 1990s, phenomenology has served as theoretical currency within archaeology. Arguably, the notion within archaeology stemmed from the work of both Crawford and Hoskins, who both sought to dem document the archaeological past by a range of methods which required different phenomenal perspectives, such as photographs, maps, and walking through the landscape. It was not until 1994, however, that philosophy fundamentally changed the mode of phenomenology within archaeology. Tilly was perhaps the first within Anglophone archaeology to introduce the phenomenal philosophy of Merleau-Ponty into archaeology, um, and he explicitly drew on Merleau-Ponty to argue in favour of the primacy of corporeal experience in knowing the material world, um, and ultimately his analysis required a reliance in the first-person perspective um, of moving through the landscape to access how people may have experienced and embodied these landscapes in the prehistoric past. Um, and one of the other only archaeologists to utilize specifically philosophical phenomenology within archaeology was Thomas, who drew on the work of uh, Heidegger to assess and critique the concepts of materiality. Um, and he was specifically using, in reference to Neolithic archaeology, Heidegger's concept of Dasein, which is, as those of you who know Heidegger, is especially problematic even within, <laughs> even within Heidegger itself. <clears throat> So there are uh, really uh, three main problems, areas which uh, both the philosophic tradition and the subsequent archaeological tradition have sort of failed to deal with. Firstly, there has been no discussion over how time is manipulated and or altered when we experience the material world through technology. For example, when we take a picture of a landscape or create a map using GIS, we are sort of simultaneously alienating uh, the perspective gained and embodied um, through the landscape. And taking it outside of time and space to view it uh, uh, on to view the world solely on the basis of conception to find the relatability of objects and people in the past is what we do when we create maps using GIS and so forth. The second, in many ways, relating to the first problem, thinking of past praxis as a quantifiable and linear scale um, that can be calculated visually through uh, science. Chronology should be analysed as more of a technology, especially scientific technology. Um, which acts as an extension of the self through which we can conceptually imagine new perspectives uh, of the sequence of past actions. So in short, uh, chronologies, scientific or otherwise, offer an atemporal concept, perspe conceptual perspective of the lived experience of people uh, in the past, which we need to be, uh, I argue, conscious of reflexively. Um, once we are conscious of this changed perspective, we can therefore continue to analyze time as a, in a chronological progression, whilst also being reflectively aware that time in the past, in sort of agreement with what Stefan said uh, about Dylan Trigg, um, was that felt through embodied event in places, so movement in places uh, uh, equals uh, uh, time, uh, the experiencing of time. And thirdly, there has been no analysis which uh, included technologically changed modern conceptions of space and distance. 
By this I mean to suggest that because we live in an age where we can get from place to place much faster in time, our sense of journey is altered and could arguably be unrealistic um, in archaeological narratives. In the past, depending on where you were, you may not have even had horses, so travelling on foot was your only mode of transport, which would have drastically changed your experience in going to places and indeed how you experience places. Um, and since as archaeologists we do not travel sites in the sort of same similar way as our ancient subjects did, uh, our analysis uh, is changed. Or put more simply, you know, you can go to Stonehenge and the nearby Curses Monument all you like, but you've got a car there and you'll get a car back. So there's much less of a truer experience of walking, even though you can go there and walk around in a landscape. So post phenomenology. Um, Flashing lights, flashing lights. Post-phenomenology post itself uh, is a product of a group of continental uh, philosophers who questioned the efficacy of traditional subject, subjectivist and transcendental classical approaches. For the new group of philosophers, the world had grown beyond its limits, like I was saying, of classical phenomenology. And uh, after the mid uh, to late 80s, the arrival of new worldviews and identities and the change that was going on in contemporary society and technology brought with them new questions about the classical text, which fundamentally altered what it meant to experience the Herselian life world. Um, consequently, post-phenomenology was created uh, to update classical phenomenology, whilst also aiming at critiquing and expanding the classical text in relation to an updated and more encompassing philosophy of the human experience. Don Ide, who uh, is at the center of this movement, developed in sort of experimental phenomenology and eventually coined post-phenomenology as a reaction against the rigidity of classical phenomenology to create a narrative that uh, included and validated more technology as an extension of, uh, uh, of the human experience. And within archaeology, at least, this approach provided a holistic methodological tool for the modern researcher, which I found successful, uh, to filter out modern biases which were not only explicitly dealt with which weren't explicitly dealt with in past phenomenological discussions, um, again, trying to investigate the experiences of people in the past. So within post-phenomenology, um, Ide saw that technology could be used as an extension of the mm -hmm. self, insofar as bodily sensory experience was validated as a tool of formal investigation under classical phenomenology, I saw that technology was also an extension of the human experience and offered a radically new phenomenal perspective. He gave examples such as modern medical technologies like MRI scans and ultrasounds, which provided tangible and visible results to things which would have otherwise been hidden. Through these technolo te technologically aided experiences using phenomenal, uh, using uh, through phenomenology, um, which are had different from what people could have had in the past. So basically saying that people in the past couldn't have had these experiences using technology. So our experience of the life world and, and our worldviews are therefore inherently changed because we know that these technologies exist and that we can do these things. Um, however, something that Ida did not account for, and there were a few, but the one main thing in, in relation to this talk is the changing nature of time through these experiences. So taking the example of an ultrasound uh, a wee bit further, um, you can analyze an ultrasound when it is taking place in a certain space and time, but the pictures that you get to take home with you after provide a sort of atemporal conceptual memory um, of it, of a time and a place different from the observer. Uh, and within my own past research, I attempted to argue through technology that our phenomenal experience was, in a sense, uh, through things like GIS was always atemporal. The user was situated within sort of the temporally phenomenal world, um, but the visualization provided through technology, i.e. the GIS or the picture of the baby and the ultrasound, um, creates a world in which we in inhabit outside of time and space in a sense. So this is when I provide some uh, rather confusing diagrams. So. Um, Within the phenomenal analysis, my phenomenological analysis, I sort of try to divide it within two different avenues of the temporal and atemporal, and more of the conceptual. And through the atemporal, I saw that as more or less technology, that through technology we experience something uh, very different that again sort of takes us outside of being here in, in, in the actual time and space. And through the temporal, we can get that from a a much more sort of Merleau Ponty Tilly style analysis of the life world where we go there, we experience, we are, are able to, to visibly experience and also view things like cosmological time um, and, and experience things onto ourselves whilst walking in the environment. 
and this is sort of taking this for a bit further, the body as a direct instrument of investigation, the teacher wants direct sensory experience, and then something technology as an extension of the body, I saw created more of an indirect sensory experience of something that was um, uh, able to be viewed like the baby in the womb or like the GIS, which you're sort of, you're not in the inhabiting the GIS, but it offers a new perspective of things and the relatedness of things within the landscape. And this is what I sort of wanted to also um, talk about them, the perceiver, and then it's now between memory uh, and then what Merleau-Ponty sort of coined on imagination. And then you have the memory of a place, because of course, as a phenomenal archaeological phenomenologist, I was analysing being in a place after I'd already been, been in the place. So I was relying, therefore, on a memory. Um, and then when it came to the technology, I was using much more of my imagination alongside my memory of being in a place to create an analysis which sort of contained both of them. So Merleau Ponty wrote in relation to this, in relation specifically to mem for memory, he said, to remember is not to bring into the focus of consciousness a self-subsistent picture of the past, it is to thrust deeply into the horizon of the past and take apart step by step the interlocked perspectives until the experience which it epitomizes are as if relived in their temporal settings. That was something of what I was trying to do with memory of the place um, and following from his work in the visible and the invisible uh, I also wanted here to use the Pontian idea of imagination uh, sort of the, the imaginary is already so sort of directly woven into the very texture of the perceptual world I thought especially in relation to this as he directly refers to the correspondence between imagery and the real world in the preface to the phenomenology of perception when he writes how the real world is cl a closely woven fabric of series of phenomenal events um, imagination is indeed central to the perceptual world, but it is composite of sensory experiences that we already know of and we've already experienced in order to create them. So my application on Bulgarian dolmens that I visited. So my research um, in uh, uh, last year or two years ago, uh, I was in Bulgaria in order to try and sort of do a sort of Tilly-esque but using post-phenomenology analysis of dolmens within the in Bulgarian landscape. And so I was predominantly concerned with them over down here, but then there's also a lot up there that I didn't manage to get to visit. I was primarily interested in Rodofi, um, Dolmond in South Bulgaria. And these are just some of the examples of the dolmens I wanted to show so you get a better understanding. This one is what you could call a camera dolmen that's very, it's much more abstract than what they usually be. And this one I think is also debated whether in fact it is a dolmen or not a dolmen, um, as it's kind of it's argued that it could be natural because of the fact that the top one looks so sort of balanced on there, but some people do see it as a dolmen. These are ones that are less abstract, and we can definitely say are dolmens, um, and are formed of multiple different chambers and uh, multiple um, capstones on top of the chambers. And then usually what you'd have if you were excavating is you'd have the remains in the main central chamber and then the sort of um, gifts uh, were, would be in the what's called the dromos or the um, the uh, hallway if you like of the actual dolmen and this is another one this is I think is a again kind of hard to see two chambered dolmen I think the chamber for this one was back there and then this would have been this sort of hallway some of them actually have been left open um, but some of them have been closed so there's a ongoing argument as to whether the things found within the dolmens are sort of would have been there when it was created or whether people have put it in later on and taken things out so uh, there's a big dispute over actually about the findings within them and this is another one that's a little bit larger uh, many sort of chambers on that one as well so the problem that I had primarily was mapping so these pictures that I took when I was there uh, with another GIS map which I created of the relatability of the dolmen so it was these two problems of being within a landscape taking pictures of a landscape, remembering a landscape, and then creating maps in order to create some sort of relatability of dolmens through my imagination, but also my memory of actually being in a place. So there are lots of different layers that even archaeologists who have dealt with phenomenology haven't really accounted for. So when it came to my own post-phenomenological analysis, it was therefore much easier using post-phenomenology to reconcile what I was attempting using technology. 
For my past research, uh, obviously I made it to investigate the Bulgarian dolmens using post phenomenology. I did this to deduce their possible significance and relatability to the tribes dwelling around them. However, here I shall only really discuss the post phenomenological aspect of this. So my methodological problem was merging the two sets of data that I'd collected, one from travelling within the field, which you could argue is much closer to the classical understanding of phenomenology, and then pairing this with the data that, um, that I collected through GIS, which highlighted their relatability to one another. This is where post-phenomenology became especially useful as it provided for me as a researcher an avenue to express the relatedness of the two sets of data whilst acknowledging that both were ascertained by experiencing the life world directly and simultaneously, indirectly. Um, and uh, through these maps, I could argue and I could add to my visualization of my experience. I knew where things were and where they were highly related to one another as I was in the landscape, which people who built the dolmens could have also been aware of. Yet I always had the picture of the maps that I made. So uh, with my memory of the phenomenal experiences uh, of being there, I could add the temporally static technology with my direct phenomenal experience. And through this, I can visualize and analyze a more complete picture of the archeology. span So it's really through these two ways of direct and indirect phenomenal experience that time and space are not the same. Indeed, recur a sense of phenomenological and cosmological time would not even fit to explain the two avenues invest investigation. What we need to express here is the validity of combining temporal and in a sense a temporal conceptual uh, imagination aspects of our data uh, within phenomenological investigations. And moreover, as a modern day researcher visiting the sites in cars and staying in hotels, I was also able to acknowledge through this post phenomenology and reflexivity because it contained um, at the same time a very Gadamerian sense of reflexivity. I was able to acknowledge my own biases within the landscape more thoroughly than past phenomenological analysis analyses had done, thus making my work sort of increasingly self aware for the modern day researcher. So what did I learn from using post phenomenology within my research? Well, through technology, we therefore indirectly still phenomenally inhabit a place, yet our subsequent sense of time has now become fractured into direct temporal and indirect atemporal avenues within uh, our analysis. Post phenomenology, therefore, through its acceptance of technology as an extension of the self, is successful as it realizes this and encourages the coupling of these two avenues of time thus creating a more holistic and inclusive phenomenology which could more precisely answer questions I had about the landscape and the archaeology. Thank you for listening.